comprehensible how it could be achieved to, to get perpetrators so awful, <coughs> so guilty, to admit to it, to reenact it, to be present before this camera. It is it is a miracle. I don't it's uh, it's I'm totally overwhelmed by what it presents as possibilities also for future documentary filmmaking that this could even be possible is is my first reaction. And I asked him a while ago in one of those green room conversations <laughs> that people have if he had any sleeping pills for me because he's responsible for my not sleeping <laughs> last night. So I told him responsible for me sleeping. <laughs> grateful and honored by your response and very sorry to have left you sleepless. It's not sure. I know. I know. But I, um, I, I see, you saw last night the act of, uh, the Look of Silence, which is a companion piece to the act of killing, but equally you could say the act of killing is a companion piece to the Look of Silence. The two films form a larger work. Uh, it's I hope greater than the sum of the parts. And I think that a key inspiration for me in, in thinking about how I respond to the impunity that I encountered in Indonesia um, was your body of work, was Marcel's body of work, this sense of that at the same, that, that I think very, very rigorously you've always understood uh, that your films are dealing with the legacy of violence in the present. You're dealing with what happens when uh, resistance is glorified to the point that its specificity and its mes lessons elude us. Uh, somehow, but the specificity of resistance and the experience of resistance and uh, Vichy France uh, is somehow narrated as part of a national heroic narrative story and the details demand recovery, the details of how people resisted, what was that experience like, demands attention that is missing in this sort of the, the, glor the sort of glorious history of the resistance. The, the myths after the war. Yes, and just, just as importantly, the attention that needs to be paid to complicity where there's complicity and then the survival of bystanders, this sense of how a past is never past, which even in those parts of the world... Joshua, I do think that this, of course, is very different from what, what I saw last night and what you're doing. First of all, you're in the midst of the event, but also, if since I had that task of, of going back to something that happened before, it became very quickly clear to me that uh, most people, if they can, in great crisis situation, don't take a position. Most people, I think, and for good reasons, because after all, friendship and, and family and the ties of daily life make it quite understandable to me that uh, you don't join the resistance or work with the Germans like that from one day to the other. There must be a certain set of circumstances that lead 
to taking action. And in your film, there is this uh, nightmare, this form of a nightmare, of a surprise and nightmare that, that people who have done these things not only do not feel regret, but actually reenact it for you. And I suppose stunning. I suppose what what you would have done in Lucien, I mean, you, 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 you were looking for him among the, in, in the grass and so on, and uh, you, you said then uh, that was the moment I encountered the German iceberg. Could you, uh, and in, in, in Joshua's film, I, you, you got, I got the feeling this whole country is an iceberg. Uh, can you, can you uh, tell us a bit uh, how you felt when you saw this the situation of uh, hiding and not acknowledging uh, from a colleague uh, um, in Israel. In Israel, yeah. Well, first of all, feeling of total surprise that it was possible. Possible to, to get such things in such a situation on camera. Uh, in that respect, my job, which had to do with hindsight and things that happened, shooting, it, I think in this film the ratio was, must have been 20 or 25 to 1. So, uh, while filming these kind of things, uh, I tend to be rather passive and just try to gather the information from various people. And then I see how they relate to each other and in the editing process I think I then sooner or later, sometimes soon, and unfortunately sometimes later, I become a kind of storyteller. But the process of becoming a storyteller is very gradual and it depends on the material that I gather. Uh, I find no better excuse than that one right now. And the films, yes, they are long, but I hope they are not, uh, I hope there is concentration in them. I hope they are, in spite of their length, they, they are focused. I'm not sure they always are, but I, I hope so. And play they are. <laughs> Maybe we could go with, to this scene again in the, in the discussion of, uh, as Marcella said, I'm lucky that I have been on the, win on the winning side. Uh, uh, in, in your film, Joshua, one senses uh, only that uh, the story is not has not ended yet. The story what you're telling uh, us about. Uh, by the end titles saying when you have a lot of uh, functions uh, in your team, in your, in your crew, uh, and you mention them as camera anonymous, and it's, I think it's uh, 60 something persons who are anonymous. Uh, and that gives us, at least to me, uh, it, it gave me a sense of oh, there must be something. Could you explain how you worked in this situation completely different to Marcel's situation dealing with the Nazis and the Nazis are not still un un anymore in power and uh, uh, dealing with this topic when the perpetrators are still in power? Well, it was very briefly, it was very hard to work with the, 
survivors. We were always afraid when we were working with the survivors because we were under constant surveillance by the police, by the military, by paramilitary groups like the one at the heart of the act of killing. When we worked with the survivors, so when we worked with the perpetrators, it was like every, every institution, every, the police, the same military, even those who knew we had been working with survivors, uh, I think unable to, unwilling to consider the enormous consequences of really the meaning of the fact that I was seeing some people as survivors of something. They simply blocked it out and they ignored the fact that we worked with survivors and every institution, the military, the police, uh, would roll out a red carpet for everything we were doing. So in the act of killing, you see uh, they, fly a, they fly a minister of government, a minister, a minister of youth and sport up to, to help direct and even act in uh, re reconstruction of a massacre of a village, and they uh, produce a state television talk show to glorify the production of my movie, The Act of Killing, while I'm still shooting it, before it's even come out. Um, they wouldn't have glorified it after it came out, once they saw it. But I, I think, so then I was able with my crew, who came from all walks of life. They were lawyers, they were human, they were human rights lawyers, they were members of the heads of NGOs, they were human rights activists, filmmakers, all of whom, many of whom, those who worked with me for a long time, changed their careers to do these two films with me because they felt it was so important. These people, I would introduce them, luckily Indonesians only use a first name, typically, and usually only have a first name in their ID cards. I would introduce them as friends of mine and they were immediately accepted. There was no difficulty in, um, in working. It was important for me to bring my crew from a different part of Indonesia. Indonesia is a very large country. I, I think I, I, I wanted to respond to something I saw in your clip, in that clip from Memory of Justice. The sense in which um, I grew up in a family that, and my grandmother was from Berlin, my, Father's uh, father, uh, the Oppenheimer part, was from Frankfurt and escaped uh, Germany just in time. And I grew up very much with the, the, the slogan at home, never again, not just in relation to, uh, never again be, being the aim of all politics, the aim of all morality and moral discourse, perhaps even the aim of all culture, and certainly not in the narrow sense of never again to us, but never again at all. And um, when I came to understand that not only do these things happen again and again and again in different contexts, uh, and that uh, essentially the American man the, in the clip we saw is wrong when he says that Americans violate the raw laws of war, uh, less frequently than other people, where they sometimes cover it up by outsourcing those violations to other countries. Um, but when I, when I, as I gradually came to understand that, and then when I came to find myself working in 2001 for uh, coincidental reasons with plantation workers who were being poisoned by a Belgian company, and on the place where we made the look of silence, they were being poisoned at work and dying, and kept too afraid and intimidated to actually get protective clothing, masks and gloves so they wouldn't be poisoned. When I realized that this was all being done so that our vegetable oil would be kept cheap, uh, they were producing palm oil, I, I, I really felt that I could not look away as a young man from this situation, this grotesque violation of never again. And, and I think that's one of the things that I should have said this straight away, but I think your, particularly this film, Memory of Justice, was a kind of, and I think if I remember the year I saw it, I think it's right around that time, it was a kind of pole star for me in, in thinking, in, in, in sort of, in my own moral journey to making these two movies. So I, I, I haven't seen it in like 15 years, and I won't. No, have I. <laughs> I think he's perfectly sincere. I think he was an altogether admirable man. Uh, he, he 
evolve with his life, with what he learned from life and what the parts he played, the part he played in this. And one of the things I think that I know about him that were most impressive, aside from the role he played in trying to show what what Americans did in Vietnam and in North Vietnam, where he played a very considerable role. Uh, since he was a research general, was a lawyer, but he was a research general, uh, he was asked to do this journal, uh, the, the end of semester talk for a promotion at West Point. And this was in the middle of the McCarthy period. And he used the occasion to blast into McCarthy. <laughs> so he was not ignorant in that sense or innocent. He simply learned from what he was faced with. One perhaps interesting anonymous thing. He was actually portrayed in a film about the Nuremberg trials by Richard Weimann. <laughs> That's just a side. Okay, here. I don't know, I just tell that. He's, he's worth defending. Yeah, I know, I, I think I should I think I was I, I was saying somehow that he he is acknowledging he's mistaken about something. Yes. And yes, yes. He, yes. he was mistaken. Yes. And of course, but I in my heart that wounded me. I remember that you mentioned that in the Russians. I don't think it's on He he was very much uh, at this maybe naive. Why should he be surprised by discovering? And Bert brought uh, 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 But the situation was with the, with the American Indians. Uh, perhaps it was naive, but he, he just tried to adjust to what he learned in the course of the event. Whole villages, and in just a matter of weeks, 50,000 yeah. people were killed. And this is something I never learned in school, and I suppose. Uh, the Reserve General we've just seen also never learned in school, and it has to do with the victor's history and, and how that's told and how it functions. The, and the role of storytelling, therefore, in creating our political order and also our own, identi our own identities in the sense that we do identify with nations and we identify. It's always, I think that's why uh, Oscar Wilde's statement that patriotism is the virtue of the vicious is a good corrective to some of that, even if, um, even if it's only inadvertently a uh, vicious virtue. It, it can be that thing, if I may take you up on that. I think it was Samuel Johnson. It's the last resort. Patriotism is the last resort for the rest. I think that's it. The, the idea that it's that's the last resort, when nothing else is left as a refuge, then you can take refuge in patriotism. Yes. I would like to go a step forward uh, because I think uh, both of your films are also dealing with the idea or the impossibility, the impossibility of. Um, it's okay. The impossibility, okay. the impossibility of uh, reconciliation, and uh, I would like to see uh, that. I would like to uh, view another clip on your. Yeah. Um, the, the, I'll, I'll, and I'll tell you a little bit the circumstance of this scene because it, I think, offers insight into maybe it offers a very concrete way to get at the challenges of reconciliation. Um, before this, there's another perpetrator, Adi Visits, uh, who's old, 
and was a low ranking, just an execution. He would get busloads of prisoners every night, 70 at a time, sometimes women, sometimes men, and he would take the, have policemen bring them down to him one by one, and he would cut their throats off and kill them, 70 in a night. Um, and he tells, and Adi visits this old man and tells, and his daughter is there and offered to us, well, my father, since you last filmed him, Joshua has uh, got hard of hearing, he's lost his hearing somewhat, so it would be easier for you if, he sit, if I sit with him and try and you know, make sure that he's hearing everything. So she put herself in the scene and um, I understood suddenly this might become her scene because she's now going to hear all of these things that she wasn't really meant to hear, but at the same time she remembered I'd been there before and I thought we'd know to some extent what it was about. Anyway, she hears really for the first time the horrific details of what her father did. She begins the scene by saying she's proud of him for having killed all the communists, and she having killed so many communists, but then as she hears the details, we see her sort of her image of her father collapse, and this sort of, you know, it's not as simple as sadness or devastation, a kind of, she has a new father suddenly, and it's discomfort, it's very painful, and at the end of the scene she finds the courage and maybe the, the humanity to apologize, do something that none of the perpetrators are able to do, to apologize to Adi when Adi explains that his brother was killed on, on her father's behalf. Then we see this scene. This scene, it's important to say, is preceded in the film by a little clip, a more extended clip of what Adi is showing on the laptop, where we see the mother present when the book is being, when the father, the father, dead father, dead, her dead husband, now dead husband, is giving us the book and explaining that he killed Rodney, Adi's brother. So there's no doubt in the viewer's mind that the mother is lying when she says she knows nothing about this, when we enter the scene. Um, what was unique about the scene, and is not in the film, is the fact that I had spent three months with that widow and with the two sons, and with the father when he was still alive in 2004, more than a year ago, about a year before I met Anwar Kobo and started making The Act of Killing. We spent three months trying to dramatize that book. You see, the father, the father had been the villain, the primary school art and drama teacher in the village had been promoted for his role in the killings to be the head of the ministry, the, the local regional head of the Ministry of Education and Culture because he had killed all these people. But um, he presented this book to me and said, I would love to, I still do plays in the village as a kind of hobby, and wouldn't it be great to dramatize this book, which is Memoir of the Killings. So I spent three months working on that with those two sons and with the, the, the widow and with the husband when he was still alive. So it never occurred to us that they would deny knowing about the killings. In fact, the whole idea for that scene was that Adi should arrive and say, look, you know who I am, I know who you are because we're neighbors, you're, uh, it's not your fault what your father did or what your late husband did, yet we have to live together. My daughter may one day marry your grandson. How shall we live together? How shall we have some form of reconciliation where we can live together as neighbors instead of as perpetrator and survivor afraid of each other? And because the, they did know who he was, they became afraid immediately, I think, and denied any knowledge of the killings, and made it impossible for us to have that conversation. And I uh, am pushing them to watch the old footage, in fact, not to punish them or uh, take revenge for this lie, but actually to try and get past the lie so that we can come to have what I felt to be a very important discussion. And we couldn't get past the lie, they were too afraid. And in fact, I left that scene <coughs> thinking we had nothing, thinking that you know, when you shoot a scene like this, when things get very tense, you have your instincts as a documentary maker, which sort of, you're kind of on autopilot in terms of the shooting, while your head is thinking very, very hard, how do we turn, get past this obstacle? 
So I thought, I, but what you remember is, of course, all the thoughts in your head and your failure to get past the obstacle. So when I left, I thought, oh, the footage must be terrible. We have nothing from this scene. We didn't shoot the scene. We came to see enough to shoot. And only later did I realize that my instincts, in this case, served us well, and that we did have an important scene, albeit a different one. And then to finally sort of answer the question, I think we see here that everybody is afraid of each other. Um, that, that it's not just the survivors who are afraid of the perpetrators, which we gather throughout the film, but the perpetrators are also afraid of the survivors, that there's this abyss it's, it's that... It's very extreme, I'm sure I'm not the only one, that it's the youngest man who is the most negative and the most... and the, the, the one who shows a great deal of anger and refusal. And he's the youngest one, he's the one who's the furthest removed from the actual events. Isn't that so? That's so, and, and, and I, I actually don't know quite why that is. He was always more temperamental than his older brother. We had trouble. <coughs> his older brother seems more relaxed about it. Yeah, I think he... That's Perhaps he only wants to give that impression. I think, well, at the end of the scene, the older brother actually, when we saw that he was starting to call the police, and that's when... Uh, and, and, and as we were ending, and I did this thing, I it, went out to him, and he was just across the coffee table from me, and I went over to him and I put my hand on his thigh, which you can do without being in any way intimate in Indonesia, and I put my other hand on his mobile phone and said, I know you're calling the police, and I looked him right in the eye. It's absolutely fine. Give me your phone. Don't call them until we leave completely absurd, right? There's no point in calling the police once we've left. But it was pure hypnosis. I just... And, and he, he somehow went along with it and didn't, didn't, didn't call the police afterwards, I heard from the neighbors, because Adi's family was from that village. But, of course, the, they said, well, they've gone. What do you want us to do? Do you want us to go to the Medan police? The, Perhaps he just gives the impression of feeling more relaxed I because he knows that he is because he knows that the people in Papua yes. are still on his side. Well, he, he's also, Marcel, a, a, a gangster of the sort you, those of you who've seen The Act of Killing have seen a lot of. And is, that is part of the performance uh -huh. of being a good gangster, as you know, is kind of reserved. Yes. Right. But I, I think there's a fear, and I also think that uh, often, I mean, this is an obvious enough statement, but Truth and people will often have to trade justice for peace when there's no regime change. I mean, South Africa, there was a truth and reconciliation process, not because necessarily all of the victims of apartheid were content to live as, uh, as, as neighbors and brothers with their former perpetrators, with the former perpetrators, but also because there was no choice, there was no possibility for justice. So, um, I think in Indonesia there's a great variety, a great spectrum of, request, of demands, but above all, I think the survivors hope for uh, an escape from the fear that comes. That was like the buzzer that we talked too long. <laughs> There, there is a great, um, uh, just to finish up, I think that the, the survivors have, in Indonesia, often, often have a... I think the survivors in Indonesia, above all, and this was Adi's motivation for wanting this, he put it to, to meet the perpetrators in the first place, they want to escape from the trap of fear any way they can in their present lives before they get... and for their children. They don't want to be afraid of their neighbors. and. So another, so, so reconciliation and healing is something people want for the present very badly, but you cannot, but this thing you hear again and again in the act of, uh, in the look of silence, let the past be past. Well, the past is obviously never past, so long as it's still available, so, so long as it's still being used in the present as a threat to keep people afraid. I think what you're saying, uh, that I'm 
me if I'm wrong, is that for them in Indonesia, as opposed to South Africa, there is no other choice but reconciliation. Right. Yeah, and in South Africa too, I think there was a real risk of civil war if they had pushed for, uh, yes. if they hadn't given the amnesty for people who testified. Yes. Yeah. We are almost finished, Marcel. I would like to ask you one thing. Uh, now, knowledge or lack of knowledge of the final solution. Uh, the terrible discovery, again by Muslim, the only one who discovered it in these times, is he was of course one of the greatest Nazi war criminals. He was Hitler's favorite child and chose more or less chosen successor. Uh, and he was a genuinely charming man. Uh, he had a great sense of observation. Uh, he had a sense of humor. Great deal. And of course, it is someone like me, any of the other journalists who discovered that after it came out of China, is, is a surprising thing. And again, disquiet, something that makes you feel insecure to find that such a man seemed to have so many attractive science to him. Uh, I, I think I write about this in, in, in the book that has now come up in the, in the translation. There's quite a few pages devoted to Speer. Uh, one of the reasons later on that I often found myself bored with what I determinist is because Bobby, who of course I didn't have in front of a camera, it's a big difference too, but also he was so much less interesting than I would spare. <laughs> Did you, did, did you have the feeling during the encounter of uh, being charmed by him and, yes. and, 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 uh, and desperately wanting to overcome what you sensed uh, was mine? And how did you so try? I, I think I let myself carry it along with my feelings of, because also uh, it was a good idea to go along with this feeling of, of uh, mutual comprehension. They, because you get a better interview that way than if you start feeling great feelings of hostility. Uh, so uh, it was also a matter of, of uh, practical considerations. But from within that rapport that you had with him, yes. how did you, what, do you remember how you tried to get past his deception, what tactics you used? How they worked. Well, as I said, I'm not sure that I tried to get past it. Uh, I must say that at the time when the interview was made, we weren't really sure about how much historians weren't really all that sure about how much he knew. That I think is, is important. Yes. Uh, but it's also in the films, uh, that I think it's the very last time he appears, 
that for Taylor, the man we were talking about before, uh, says as much that the Spert owed his life to being a cultural, bourgeois, German, uh, of a family of architects with charm and culture, and, and that he probably uh, owed to that. Probably a couple of other things too, but that we won't necessarily go into now. Not being hand. And when I, at the end of the interview, was there, I tell him that Telford Taylor said that. And uh, his reaction, again, is relaxed and rather funny. He says, uh, well, if that's what I owe my life to, then I'm very happy. <laughs> Isn't that what he says? Approximately, that's what I say. Uh, I think one of the facts that we have to face in Speer is an illustration of that, is that uh, what we think of as monsters can uh, have committed monstrous crimes in ordinary life and ordinary conversation are not at all do not at all have the appearance of, of the deeds that they were of, of having done the deeds that, excuse me, by the English, of, they don't have the, give the appearance of having done what they actually have done. In, um, Hannah Arendt wrote of Eichmann that he was yes. perhaps because I felt like almost the perpetrator, that I was the one continuing. It was this weird role reversal where Anwar was trying to take care of me and I was saying, no, we must continue. There's a scene in the uncut version of the act of killing where Anwar's butchering a teddy bear of all things and I, am, and I started to cry while shooting it and he stopped me because he said, are you okay? Do you need to stop? And I said, no, no, you must continue. And I, that was the beginning of eight months of real insomnia. And I, so I used to have sleeping pills. <laughs> I'm over it, I'm over it. The look of silence was actually healing for me. And so I, if I was still in that, happily I don't have any medicine for you, but I would have a couple years ago. So.